my name is Marcel Jemba, and I'm software engineer at Google, and I'm also one of the two chairs of Six Scalability. And today we'll be talking about Six Scalability introduction and also deep dive. So the first question that we need to answer is what we do as a Six Scalability. Six Scalability is a bit different from other Six because we do not own uh, we do not own um, production code. We only own test code that we use for testing the scalability of Kubernetes. So basically, we do have five areas, uh, five areas that we are interested in, in terms of scalability. So first of all, the most important is actually defining what the scalability is. Um, and once we know what the scalability means, which, will I, which I will explain later, uh, we also want to set up some goals. So you can think of it as, you know, we could start improving the Kubernetes by making some improvements, but it doesn't matter if the end user is not able to see those improvements and actually have uh, some better scalability properties. Um, except for defining and driving those goals, we also uh, contribute to Kubernetes in a way that we want to make Kubernetes more scalable. So what we do is uh, we usually coordinate between six or, or ask other six to actually make some improvements in order to make Kubernetes more scalable. But, okay, let's say that we, we do have those goals in mind for Kubernetes that we want to achieve. But first of all, we need to measure and monitor how the performance and scalability of Kubernetes actually changes over time. Um, you probably know that every day uh, there are multiple PRs merged into Kubernetes, and each of these PRs, these features, these changes can potentially impact the performance of the whole Kubernetes. So that's why uh, one of the most important areas of SIG scalability is actually monitoring uh, the performance of Kubernetes uh, to make sure that we do not regress, uh, which is actually the next, next point here. So basically, uh, once we have this monitoring, then we are able to track different metrics and see if there is any regression. Um, and last but not least, we also consult and coach other six. So probably uh, most of you know that there are caps, which cap is kind of like design doc. And when you are when you want to implement new feature, there are some sections that are specific to six scalability um, with questions like how does your feature impact um, control plane or what kind of calls is making your, uh, making your feature that are additional to the previous state. Um, so one more important part is not to confuse, wait a second. Oh. Not to confuse SIG scalability with SIG autoscaling, these are two different SIGs. So what is the Kubernetes scalability? So sometimes we ask our users, okay, what do they want? And basically they say, well, they want scalable clusters. But if we ask them like, okay, but what does it mean? Well, they usually don't really know. Because scalability is not just a single number. So I can give you one example where in 2015, the Kubernetes 1.0 was actually supporting 100 nodes. And then this number changed over a few releases uh, to 1,000 nodes, 2,000, 5,000 nodes. And 5,000 nodes was supported in 2017 uh, in Kubernetes 1.6. And this number did not change this number did not change since 2017. So what I want to say is that the scalability of Kubernetes is not just the number of nodes. It's much more than that. So now I, I just want to introduce this concept of scalability envelope. So if you think about Kubernetes and the scalability, what you want to actually uh, think of is multi-dimensional problem. So there are many, many more dimensions that you want to um, take into account when thinking about the scalability of Kubernetes. 
So just to give you a few examples, like number of nodes is just one of the dimensions that we are interested in. But then you have like number of secrets or like how many pods you can have per node or pot, pot churn, for example. And now, taking into account all those dimensions, um, we have scalability envelope. So the scalability envelope is safe zone. So if you are within it, your cluster is happy, but we still don't know what does it mean that the cluster is happy. So you can think of it as like, if you are within those limits, then something happens. And now I will try to explain what. So what does the happiness of the cluster mean? So in order to think about cluster being happy, uh, we need to introduce two concepts. One is SLI, which is service level indicator, and SLO, which is service level objective. So in simple words, I think uh, about SLI as a metric. So let's say I have metric that says um, pod startup latency is X second. Uh, and then on top of this metric, uh, what I can do is put some kind of threshold. So for example, I want to have pod startup latency, like 99th percentile of pod startup latency to be below specific threshold. So for example, in Kubernetes, it would be five seconds. Um, so, so basically the cluster is happy uh, when all the scalability SLOs are satisfied. Um, so I, I just want to give you a few examples of scalability SLOs and this, this list of scalability SLOs is actually uh, changing uh, over time. And we started with uh, very two simple SLOs a uh, few years ago, which was API call latency and, and pod startup latency. You can find all those uh, SLOs and the description uh, on our six scalability uh, page. Uh, but I wanted to give you some kind of um, idea uh, how well those SLOs are defined. Because just saying that we care about the call latency is not enough. Um, there is actually way, way more uh, definition to that. And so let's start with the SLI, SLI for the API call latency. So the SLI for API call latency for mutating requests only is defined as you take five minutes window and you choose one resource, one verb. So let's say deployments and patch. And what you want to do is you measure 99th percentile within this window. Um, so you can think of it as like for each resource, for each verb, you will have different metric. And then what we do, we say that the SLO is uh, kind of aggregated for each specific resource and verb um, for the whole day. So in the whole day, you have 200, like 88 uh, windows of five minutes, and then only, only two can like not met this, this kind of um, threshold, which is one second. So we want to have all the mutating API calls to be within one second. And if you have like 288 windows of five minutes, then basically, uh, basically you can only have two windows that are not meeting this one second threshold. So this is how the, uh, how the definition of the API call latency SLO look, looks like. So that's just one of the six that I showed before. And once we have that, and we have the scalability envelope, um, what we can do is actually test test some limits because um, computing the whole scalability envelope is impossible. Uh, as you can see, there are like multiple dimensions and you could think of it as, you know, like I could have zero pods, but like one million namespaces, but is it useful? It's, it's not really useful for, for the user. So what we want to do is kind of model it, how our users use Kubernetes. And let's say that, okay, we are interested in some limits like number of nodes to be up to 5,000, number of pods like 30 pods per node, number of services to 10,000. And 
as a six scalability, what do we do? We actually run those tests that maximize all those limits, and we check for all the, all the SLOs and make sure that they are met. Uh, and you can find all those thresholds that I mentioned. Like here, we have three examples, but you can also find multiple other thresholds uh, or limits, like for pot churn or number of secrets and, and so on. So now we will move toward, towards um, actually our infrastructure, like what kind of uh, tools we use for making sure that the scalability envelope and all those SLOs are, are satisfied in Kubernetes. So the most important tool that we use is Cluster Loader 2. So Cluster Loader 2, 2 is actually our, our internal um, Six scalability tool used for for testing um, testing scalability of Kubernetes. So what you can think of it is that you provide some kind of states that you want your cluster to be in. So let's say that you are starting with empty cluster, and then you want to make sure that the cluster is working when you have 1,000 deployments and 100,000 pods, for example. So you are specifying this state. Uh, and then let's say you are also specifying how do you want to transition through from empty state of the cluster to, the, to this desired state. Uh, so you, let's say you are saying that you want to uh, create one deployment per one second, for example. And cluster loader is actually doing that. So uh, it, cluster loader is creating those, those deployments as you, as you wish. Uh, and along the way, the cluster loader is also measuring uh, all those SLIs and SLOs to make sure that, you know, for example, pod startup latency uh, did not exceed five seconds during the whole test. And there is also a bunch of, bunch of other, um, other, other features that you can use for, for example, for debugging, uh, but I will mention a few a bit later. Also, you can imagine that if you want to test 5,000 nodes, uh, using real clusters is pretty expensive. Uh, even if it's like, you know, one CPU per, per node, then it's still 5,000 CPUs. So running those tests, it's, it's, it's pretty expensive. And um, as a six scalability, we cannot run them like super often. So uh, 5,000 nodes tests are run only once a day. But we also do have KubeMark. And KubeMark, it's something that we call as a cluster simulation. Um, so basically the idea is that um, we have KubeMark master. And what we are trying to do is actually test this, this master. Um, and we don't want to use 5,000 nodes. So what do we do is we actually create, let's say 80 or 100 nodes. And on those nodes, what we do is we actually run something that simulates hollow nodes. Uh, so uh, what we do is we run hollow nodes and those hollow nodes simulate the traffic that the normal control plane would, would see. And with that improvement, uh, basically instead of having 5,000 nodes, we can usually do with like 80 nodes and each let's say four or eight uh, CPUs, which brings down the cost significantly uh, down. But of course the issue is here like, okay, so let's say that we want to have this kind of setup where we have three actual nodes and uh, here 15 hollow nodes. So how do you actually run those hollow nodes? So these hollow nodes, these hollow nodes actually need to be somehow scheduled onto the real nodes. So this is actually pretty funny because we use also Kubernetes. To, to do that. Uh, so there are actually two clusters. One cluster that is responsible for, uh, for running those hollow nodes on actual nodes, and those hollow nodes are connected to the separate master that we want to scale test. And because of that improvement, we are able to actually run scalability tests much more often because it does not consume as much resources uh, as like regular clusters. 
Except for that, uh, we have a bunch of monitoring and observability tools. And Perfdash, Perfdash is one of our favorite tools. It looks super simple. It's super simple, but it allows us to find multiple regressions. Um, because, you know, like I mentioned before that, um, you know, we have SLOs, we have some tests, but there are sometimes regressions that are not found by just SLOs. Let's say that um, the pod startup latency, actually this is the pod startup latency example, and um, there was some regression some time ago. And we only saw that the number of, that the uh, pod startup latency increased by like 400 milliseconds. And once we found it, we fixed it. And basically here you can see that we bring, brought down the latency of pod startup latency by 400 milliseconds. But our tests were not able to actually find it um, because the SLO says that, you know, the 99th percentile needs to stay below uh, five seconds, which was still, still true. Uh, but we still saw the regression due to the perf dash and, uh, and all those cool charts here. Except for that, if you want to also see um, one particular uh, run of our um, scalability test, then you can use our Grafana dashboards. Uh, they are super useful and you can just use them. For, for debugging scalability issues. Um, and also, like when you're running cluster loader, uh, cluster loader two, out of box, you get much more, uh, much more uh, observability also in terms of profiling. So when running the test, we are also gathering memory and CPU profiling. And so for example, then later you can see that, okay, during the uh, load test, there were some parts where the control plane CPU was burning quite heavily, and you can just grab the profiling and see what kind of parts of the Kubernetes control plane was actually consuming the CPU. So now we move to the scalability tests. So I showed you all those tools that we use for monitoring and testing the scalability of Kubernetes. But now what kind of test we are actually running to, to ensure that the Kubernetes is scalable. So um, there are two types of periodic tests that we run. Uh, one are release blocking tests. And release blocking tests, there are actually performance tests for 100 nodes, 5,000 nodes. And these are actually run on real clusters uh, and also correctness, 5,000 nodes. So the performance is purely about the performance, like how fast the pod startup latency is or like what kind of latencies do we have on the control plane. And correctness is more about that the features that Kubernetes is providing still work when you have like 5,000 nodes in your cluster. Uh, except for that, we, we do have non-release blocking tests and they are super informative. So one of the examples, one of my favorite examples is actually uh, benchmarking for Goang. So in the past, over the last, I think, three or four years, uh, we've noticed that there were m multiple regressions coming from, from the Goang. Uh, so what we did was actually we froze all the dependencies except for the Goang compiler. And what we do is, we just have frozen Kubernetes version and we run our cluster loader performance test uh, and we just change the Go compiler version. And based on that, we noticed if there are some regressions in Golang compiler uh, and we just informed the Golang team that, okay, we noticed that there is regression between like, for example, those two commits and they are able to easily detect those regressions as well because Kubernetes is actually one of the actually the biggest project, uh, I think, in, in going. So it's super useful for them as well to validate uh, if they are not introducing any regressions. But except for that, we have also the, the cube mark, some, some bunch of storage tests, and so on. Oh. 
there is one more thing I wanted to mention. So if you are contributing to Kubernetes, then whenever you open PR, there is a bunch of pre-submits, and one of the pre-submits uh, is actually uh, the performance uh, 100 nodes test. Test. So whenever you open PR, there is actually a job running that creates 100 nodes cluster, and it's uh, running the load test to check if there are no any obvious regressions in performance. And that's basically it in terms of scalability tests, how we protect the scalability of Kubernetes. So I mentioned those CI tests, and you can see the, uh, our test grid. Uh, what's happening basically is like we have those tests running for, for the master branch, and also we do have for all releases that will be happening, uh, for example, 124 or 125, uh, the releases are still happening, so we are still running those tests. And this test grid is actually available to everyone. If you want to see, you can just uh, go uh, to, to our test grid and see in what state the current Kubernetes uh, scalability is. So I mentioned few few of the uh, standard regressions that we already saw, but scalability is super sensitive. Um, one small change can break the whole scalability of Kubernetes, uh, and we've seen uh, regressions pretty much from everywhere, like Golang, I mentioned my favorite, but then also operating system or controllers, API machinery, scheduler, etcd, kubelet, you name it. It's it's basically all. Um, so what, what's happening is that usually once we observe that there is some, some regression, we kind of try to narrow down where this regression happened and usually contact author or even revert the whole feature if, if we think that um, the scalability is not a, as good as it was before. So there, there are a few actually um, pretty interesting uh, regressions that we uh, solved uh, quite recently. Um, to, name a f to name one example, um, so for example, there was um, recently introduced, recently, uh, Priority and Fairness, uh, probably you heard about it, and um, some of the calls in Priority and Fairness were uh, incorrectly estimated. And because they were incorrectly estimated, they were consuming way more, uh, we call it seats. And um, what was happening was that in some of the setups that our customers use, um, the API call latency was significantly higher than it's supposed to be. So um, that's something that, for example, we recently detected and fixed um, last few versions. And there is the um, also interesting part where we actually drive some improvements. Um, so again, like going back to Golang, uh, it's not like Golang was only introducing uh, regressions in Kubernetes. Migra migration to Golang 118 uh, helped help Kubernetes performance quite significantly. But maybe you also heard that the memory footprint um, also increased significantly. So um, this is one of the examples where actually the improvement was, was quite huge. Uh, 99th percentile of API call latencies was, was basically like 10 times uh, smaller than it was before. So it was quite huge improvement. Uh, but there are also some other, uh, some other improvements that we made, uh, like page size progression for rare selectors. So what you can do is you can list some resources from the API server and you can provide limit. So let's say that you provide limit of one, but you also have some field selector. So what was happening was that uh, whenever, whenever you were making such call, uh, there, the elements from the etcd were fetched one by one. So if you have like very rare um, selector and let's say you have 1,000 items and only the last one matches the selector, what was happening was that 
uh, there were actually um, there were actually 1,000 calls to to add CD made, um, but we fixed it with uh, progression of the limit. So um, the limit that you use for the API calls to API server is no longer bound to the limit uh, that we used for fetching the results from Ed CD. So um, now to sum up, like if you want to get involved, um, we have homepage where you can find all the contact information if you are interested in scalability. Uh, we do have uh, bi-weekly public meetings. Uh, we do have also a mailing list. Uh, and if you are, want to get involved in, for example, our testing infrastructure, we do have some uh, issues that are uh, marked as help wanted. So you can just pick up one and uh, and get involved in scalability of Kubernetes. And now we have, um, I think, a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, do we have a microphone, maybe? Okay. Hi, uh, my question is uh, basically, is it the scale we recommend uh, to which uh, um, Kubernetes operators can go, uh, the one which you are testing? Mm -hmm. So if you, they go beyond that, it's their own risk, so to say. That's, that's a great question. So um, actually um, what's happening is that th there are limits, as I mentioned, that we are testing. Like, for example, 5,000 nodes or 10,000 services. Uh, and if you go beyond that, what's usually happening, the performance is degrading kind of like gracefully in a, in a way that, you know, the latencies start increasing and everything starts to slow down. But it's usually not like it just breaks. But uh, that's right that usually it's, it's uh, the cluster uh, operator who is responsible for that that needs to monitor it and make sure that those limits um, are, like the cluster is within those limits. But there is also one more thing that I want to mention that um, to make sure that all those SLOs are met, uh, there are, there is also a bunch of requirements that you, your cluster needs to, uh, to, to, to be following. For example, one of the requirements here, we have that, you know, the control plane, um, you have to have 64, cores, for example, or you have to have two instances of at CD and so on. So basically there is the bunch of list of requirements that you need to also uh, have implemented in your cluster to, to make it scalable to those limits. But it's all documented there, basically. Thank you. So a follow-up to the question. Uh, so is there documented what happens when those latencies increase beyond 5,000 and, uh, and when it degrades, what happens? And is it able to recover um, when, when you de reduce the load? So um, there is no document like that. And the reason is that it really depends. Like we are sure that, you know, if you have vanilla setup of Kubernetes, and you don't have um, super fancy controllers, then it will work, right? But once you start using some of the components, I've seen in the past that there are components that actually do not gracefully kind of like um, stop working, but they just break the whole cluster at some point. Like if you, if you reach the limit of whatever, let's say, let's say secrets, uh, then if you have 20,000 secrets will just stop working, for example. And there are components like that that cluster operators sometimes install. So there is no really simple answer here because there are so many components you can install in Kubernetes that it always depends on what kind of components do you have. Uh, the second question I had was, um, what is the significance of that 100 node test that you talked about? So this is kind of like um, our first 
first test that each change is tested on. Um, because, you know, in a perfect world, what we would be doing is like whenever someone makes PR to Kubernetes, we would run 5,000 nodes test that tests everything, but that's super expensive. So what we are doing is basically we are running this 100 nodes test instead, which is much cheaper and we can do that. Got it, but why 100? I mean, 100 is kind of like, uh, can you just mic? Yeah, yeah uh, just last question. I mean, why 100? Like 100 is a too less of a number. Is it just because of cost you're saying or? Uh, so it's actually both cost, but also uh, it also detects, um, it also detects like very basic like regressions, like significant regressions. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it actually saves us quite a lot of time to, to debug it because once it's passed and merged to the master branch of Kubernetes, then uh, if we observe regression on larger scale, then it actually involves like human person to, to, to go through and see what kind of changes were made and what was regressed. So this is kind of like, you know, first, first test to reduce the number of noise. Um, for, uh, for actually for what it's worth, uh, we did have a, uh, one of our clusters that went above like 5,000 uh, nodes and uh, the control plane just broke <laughs> and never recovered. Uh, but uh, that's actually a great segue to my question. Um, you had a slide on profiling for mm -hmm. a Cube API server. Do you need to have access to the control plane? Because uh, there's a lot of cloud providers that don't give you that access. That's, that's true, yeah. So um, in open source, we are actually testing, you know, um, like fully on our VMs. We are not testing, you know, EKS or GKE. Uh, we are only testing uh, Kubernetes as, you know, yeah. the open source version, basically. And so there we have it, the access. Yeah, just two questions. The first one is that um, for the, we are developing some platform and then part of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So what is, is there any guideline to, you know, test those operators, like custom resource? Yes, question. so that, that's a great question. Um, currently there is no guidance for it, but um, this, this, this topic is actually um, coming up more and more often. So probably we will need to uh, invest some time into some guidance how to write controllers and uh, operators in a way that they do not put too much load on the control plane. Um, but from experience, I would say that usually uh, the biggest issues are with the agents that are running on all the nodes. Uh, then there is a chance that if you have some kind of specific bug, then you put too much load on the control plane and you can break basically control plane. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that was your question or? Sort of, you know, um, we're trying to see, evaluate the uh, performance and scalability of the controller in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Maybe not exactly the Kubernetes cluster per se, but uh, controller is part of the, you know, you talk to API server and mm -hmm. the scheduler and SAD, all of the loads are there. And then in this kind of context, um, yeah, I've been trying to, still trying to figure out what is the best way to evaluate this as controllers or, or the platform wise. But I think that's, um, yeah, that's fine. I think the, we can skip to the second question is that in the cube mark, there's um, no pod uh, created, right? It's like a hollow node as you mentioned, mm -hmm. right? And so in that sense, um, so this pod creation time or something, if we want to evaluate that, then KubeMark, is there any other tools and tooling you know that can um, evaluate this um, pod, like, actual pod really? Yeah. So um, not really. Uh, so I think, uh, I think like, yeah, in KubeMark, basically we are not running those pods, so it's just simulated. Um, but I don't think there exists anything that, you know, like if, if you start running those pods and containers, then basically you're, you're close to having like real cluster, real. I think, yeah. Okay. We have time for our last question, I think. Thank you. Uh, I think on one of the, your slides, you list like a three regression mm -hmm. issues. 
one of the three, I think, if I remember right, is uh, about part startup latency. Mm -hmm. So, did did that uh, uh, was that issue ever fixed? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. it was fixed. Actually, actually, I can give a bit more context there. Um, so, so there was there was some feature developed um, in Kubernetes, and uh, by accident, what happened was that. Uh, for each request that was made to API server, there were two goroutines created. And you know, by itself, like, it shouldn't have huge impact, but we observed because, you know, in our scalability test, we have hundreds of thousands of goroutines in the API server. And because we doubled that, uh, what was happening that the Golang scheduler was already kind of slowing down. And because of that, we saw the regression in post startup latency. Yeah, but yeah, then basically we just reverted this PR um, because we decided that, you know, um, we need to fix it because the regression was quite significant. Uh, and then um, Autor had to actually implement it in a way that we were not increasing the number of goroutines uh, in the API server. Okay. Well, okay, <laughs> I don't know. We, can we? One more question? <laughs> Just a quick one. Uh, so basically, um, all of the um, examples and uh, info that you gave on, uh, were were uh, mostly about uh, reactive um, uh, reactive action to to changes in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're doing a lot of testing and um, catching the scalability issues and fixing them uh, when they get merged. But uh, how about the um, um, trying to improve the actual scalability of the mm -hmm. project with the baseline that we have. So, for example, you had that five seconds deadline there. Is the SIG working on trying to get those thresholds lowered, uh, actually doing uh, profiling of uh, what's taking up those three seconds that you are considering like the normal baseline now? Or is that something that's uh, completely out because you, you don't actually own the production code? Mm, so, I think. So how we usually operate is we, we really want to set our goals based on our customers' expectations. So it's not just, you know, Im improving based on, you know, like just make, just like possibility of improving. So uh, there are some, some metrics that our users care about and there are some metrics that users don't, they don't, do not care about, but we still measure them in order to catch regressions. Um, but there were some, some improvements that actually uh, we, but they still came from like our users. So what we were seeing, for example, is that uh, people use uh, quite a lot of secrets. And what, what's happening is that when you use secret and you mount the secret to pod, uh, this pod or kubelet actually opens, opens, uh, opens watch. And uh, we introduced immutable secrets to kind of resolve this issue to reduce the number of watches and increase scalability. But I think we need to actually finish right now. But I will be still, still here, so if you want to talk, then uh, feel free. Thank you.